Hello and welcome back to Perspectives, bringing you our daily dose of news and views covering the topics we hope are relevant to you. Well, today we examine why six are now becoming seriously concerned about Kamala Harris. We report on India's uncomfortable high-level meeting with the other quad countries, and more politicians stand up publicly against the extended detention of Amrit Pal Singh. And as the dust settles in Calgary after the referendum, we have a little more interesting inside information of events there. And talking which, joining me as always for Perspectives is our very own correspondent in Canada, James Cousineau. Good morning, James. Good morning, Angus. It's nice to be back in the studio, but uh, due to a power glitch, the uh, studio is not as cool as it normally would be. So I think we're both sweating this morning with the weather. <laughs> Unseasonal, unseasonable warmth here in the UK. But anyway, James and I together will be bringing you our perspectives on the daily news affecting the Sikh community across the world. Of course, as always, we will be taking a look at some of your wonderful comments and the interesting debates taking place below some of our videos. But let's get the show on the road. James, what have you got to start us off with today? Well, I thought we would start with a uh, bit of the uh, fr uh, the ruckus at the uh, at the Khalistan referendum in Calgary. Now, unfortunately, there were some people being you know a bit aggressive and uh, and misbehaving. However, I wanted to just bring that up because of the fact that these were not people involved with the referendum. These were not people that were taking aim at the referendum. It just happened to be that in the downtown core of Calgary, where we were, uh, there are some homeless and uh, people who are a bit downtrodden. And they seem to be the ones that were uh, causing the melee, taking Khalistan flags, throwing them around, threatening each other with sticks. And I'll just share a quick video here of some of the individuals. So it's not... Uh, to be confused at all with the referendum. It was very peaceful. Uh, there was no violence there. It was just uh, people from outside of the referendum causing the melee. And unfortunately, because they were right mixed in with, of course, the area that we were in, it wasn't a closed off area. So it just came up and might have looked to some as though it was uh, a part of the event, but it definitely was not. You can see the individual in the blue shirt here, you know. So yeah, I just wanted to share that quick clip there because I thought it was important that people understand that it was not to do with the referendum. Uh, that some points these individuals had taken Khalistan flags, they were throwing them towards the uh, towards the portable restrooms where people were at. Uh, they were throwing cups and uh, liquids at each other at one point. They were fighting and you know different things. But again, I just thought it was important to bring up that the uh, that the uh, Khalistan referendum was very peaceful. There were uh, individuals there that were causing a problem, threatening people, and just being, you know, themselves, I guess is a sad way to put it. So, but again, it's just one of those situations where you are mixed in with the general public. You don't have an enclosed area. And unfortunately, everybody's welcome to come and go. Uh, and I say unfortunately just for the fact that, you know, it sometimes gives the bad or the wrong impression to people from the outside looking in. So I think it's important just to make that note so that if people are telling you that they saw violence or this or that, you can just make sure that you've got evidence to say, no, it had nothing to do with the referendum. They were not targeting the referendum and so forth. There was one individual that we spoke of yesterday that tried to disrupt the event and whatnot, but it was a verbal altercation, not physical, and he was removed by the uh, security and the police from the location and we suspect that that may have been, you know, somebody that was representing India's interests that wanted to cause a problem there. But again, all of the people that showed up for the referendum, it was a beautiful, beautiful day. Yeah, but that'll throw it back to you for comment there, Angus, and then we'll go on to the next one. Yes, uh, it's, it's very important that we raise things like this, even if they are irrelevant, because actually it's situations like this and it's, it's incidents like this that Hindutva sees upon because it's very easy to twist the narrative. You know, you can present this in any, all sorts of ways. Oh, there was trouble at the referendum, etc. It's very easy to spin yeah. this to uh, create a very negative image of the referendum. 
So yeah, I think it's very important that we uh, get to the bottom of, of incidents like this and just show immediately, let's, let's preempt any misinformation, any mischievous misinformation that Hindutva could spread about this. What is, uh, what is nice to, to remark upon, I've, I've seen this from all, uh, every, every single event of the referendum, wherever in the world that it's taken place, it has been a wonderful ev uh, event, a wonderful occasion. There have been families there, you know, uh, whole families, including children, have turned out, uh, as, as I keep saying, a sea of yellow flags. The mood is always very positive. There's always a very buoyant, enthusiastic, positive mood uh, sw swilling around the area. It's, it's great to see. And people are clearly there on a mission, but all or most united, certainly uh, aligned with the whole concept of Khalistan. So, of course, it does create this sort of very positive atmosphere, which is great to see. Um, of course, there has been some negativity that we've reported on. That is the graffiti. Um, hopefully not seen directly or, or, or hasn't impacted directly on the actual day the referendum but we have seen graffiti and damage deliberate damage being done to a lot of the signs the uh, the referendum signage uh, and publicity material has been has been defaced which uh, not just un yeah. undemocratic it um, it's it's very distasteful and again it uh, it creates quite a uh, i would say it, it again it it means Hindu are losing credibility. They're losing the argument if they're resorting to these sorts of uh, tactics. So, yeah, thank you for that, James. Uh, interesting to, to ensure that the truth prevails. Absolutely. And with so many people, you know, whether it's Calgary or anywhere else with cell phones and that, it's just, you know, easy for it to be put out as the wrong narrative. So... At the uh, at the end of the day, it was really important to not only bring that up, but also just to share that a lot of the downtrodden or the homeless in the area came over to where the referendum volunteers were actually cooking and feeding. You know, all of the uh, all of the Kalistan referendum voters, but also the community. So a lot of them came over. They were fed. They had things to drink, and so most people actually had a lot of uh, exciting things about the uh, about the community being there. And uh, not to mention the amazing food. So they were pleased with that. And as we're talking about who was in attendance and who wasn't, and uh, the mischievous ones are now out of the way, let's move over to a positive one. Mr. Hardeep Singh Najjar, as most people know, was the leader in the Surrey Gurdwara, who was executed in the parking lot uh, a couple of years ago. Now, the four individuals are still facing trial. It's a slow process in Canada sometimes, especially when you have four co-defendants. All of the information has to go from the Crown Prosecutor and the RCMP and others to the defense attorneys. The defense attorneys with four different uh, defendants has to coordinate how they're going to work with that. So right now, they're still waiting on disclosure documents and so forth. Then they will go forward with all of the uh, all of the motions and all of the processes before they get to the pre-trial. Now the pre-trial will be where they evaluate both sides. They have all their cards on the table and decide how they're going to proceed in front of the judge, if the evidence is strong, whatever the case may be, and to set a trial date. Now with that stated, Mr. Hardeep Singh Najjar's family was on site, several family members were on site in Calgary. They made the long distance drive or commute, as did I, and they were there to show their support for the referendum because as we know, Mr. Najjar was very involved and instrumental in organizing a lot of these events and a very uh, vocal supporter and uh, of, of the Khalistan referendum and of the independent Sikh homeland. So I thought it was important just to bring up that the family was there. And in addition, they did many prayers on the stage. They did many chants and other things just to support the family and to memorialize Mr. Niger's work and the fact that uh, he was taken at the hands of these individuals who may have been working on behalf of the India government. So even more important was just that they were there publicly to stand their ground. Mr. Niger's brother has, uh, he did speak with me for a few minutes and we were talking about uh, the attempted assassinations of himself as well. There have been attempts on his life and threats. He has been informed by the police that there is a threat and a uh, and an active contract out on him, but he did not want to hide from that. He's going to stand proud. He's going to stand tall, 
And he is also going to be in contact to do an interview with us here on this show. So stay tuned for that. We still have to set it up, so that'll be sometime down the road. But we will be having an interview with uh, Mr. Niger's family. And uh, we'll be talking about a lot of different topics in that. But I thought it was just important to really show the uh, support that the entire Sikh community has for the Niger family and that they will be paying attention and supporting them all the way through this difficult time and through the difficult and challenging trial process as it proceeds down the road. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's a, fa a fantastic uh, legacy. Uh, the whole referendum campaign as it continues, I mean, he was a very highly respected figure by all accounts uh, in his Gurdwara. And of course, he was heavily involved in the uh, in the organisation and the running of the the referendum. So yeah, what better way uh, to I think to commemorate uh, Mr. Najjar uh, after his passing is to hold uh, this uh, the latest iteration of the referendum and to keep this thing going and to keep it rolling forward. And uh, yeah, we look forward to that interview, James. So I think that'll be very interesting. Of course, we do forget. No, we don't forget. We do remind people on a regular basis. We do report on it, but it's very easy to forget that there are still many people in the community who have these threat to life warnings against them. That They've been warned by, in Canada, CSIS, here in the UK by MI6, and of course the counterpart CIA in the, in the US, that members of the Sikh community have received warnings from the intelligence services that their lives are still in danger from Indian agents. Indian agents we know are still operating. We still know that they are using the underworld, the criminal underworld, to do their dirty work. So yeah, th there are many in the community, yeah. particularly who are campaigning for Khalistan, who um, are living under literal life threats. So yeah, our, our support goes out to them and our thoughts uh, go with their family and uh, we hope they, uh, they stay safe, James. Exactly, Angus. And, uh, you know, it's just a matter of the entire community continuing to support them. It's not just the Sikh community, but here locally in Surrey, the entire community and uh, all of Canada, for that part, really stands by them in not only supporting the family through this process, but also in demanding that India stop with their interference of the rule of law in Canada, their interference of our systems and processes, and to stop these uh, extrajudicial killings on foreign soil. So, Indeed. Okay, let's move on to my first story and let's drop south of the Canadian border down into the US. And uh, we have reported a lot about uh, Kamala Harris, or is it Kamala Harris, depending on, on who you listen to. Um, there have been uh, a lot of concerns about uh, Miss Harris from um, the Sikh community, as it turns out. And they have been uh, digging up a bit of her past and her track record. And it turns out that uh, she has already fallen foul of the Sikh community a few years ago. And it turns out, uh, and I'll just quickly run through, I'll quickly paraphrase a summary of, of what happened uh, about some, some 15 or so years ago when she was uh, the attorney in California. And uh, this particular article uh, is headed, we had hopes that because of her Indian heritage, she might be more sensitive to the religious discrimination faced by Sikhs. Far from it, she was uncaring and dragged out this specific case, the details of which I shall now go into. So what has caused her to become so unpopular with the Sikh community? Well, in uh, the, the case re refers back in 2005, and it relates to a gentleman, a Sikh, who was a former Indian Navy officer, and he came to America in 1999. And he subsequently applied for a job as a California correctional officer, a CO job, with the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, the CDCR, that's basically the prison service. And uh, in 2006, he passed his written test for the job and he was given a conditional offer for this role. It was conditional upon various things, including a vision test, his physical test, background investigations, etc., etc. And he passed all these tests with flying colours. But then, of course, there was, he was required to do a pre-employment medical examination. And he didn't do this, as it would require a respirator fit test. Now, this respirator fit test required, required him to be clean shaven, of course, because, of course, the respirator needs a close fit around, around the face. Of course, being a Sikh, he couldn't shave his beard. 
and he said uh, he, it was it was his religious belief and it was his right as his religious belief not as, as a practicing Sikh not to have to shave his beard. The CDCR deemed Oberoi ineligible for this job that he'd applied for. And that was a decision which he would then appeal to the California State Personnel Board in 2007. So he went legal on this. He said, hang on a second, this is clear discrimination. Now, he actually won that case. Uh, he won the appeal on it. And uh, it was discovered or it was found legally that he was discriminated against on the basis of religion. Now, interestingly, yeah. Harmeet Dillon, this is the lady who we talked about at great length the other day. Harmeet Dillon is that Sikh lawyer who uh, who presented to the Republican convention recently. Uh, she gave that uh, prayer at the opening of the convention. Of course, she faced all sorts of uh, uh, pretty vile um, abuse on Twitter from the Christian extremist community, but she was a fabulous standout uh, Sikh achiever, high achiever, who presented this wonderful prayer at the opening of the convention in front of Donald Trump. But she, of course, is a lawyer and has been a very successful practicing lawyer, uh, representing many Republican causes, as it happens. And it just turns out she also represented Mr. Oberoi in this case. And she worked alongside the Sikh Coalition in the US, that's a nonpartisan advocacy organization based in the US, who particularly uh, represents Sikh Americans. And uh, they both represented Oberoi during the appeal. Now, the discriminatory policy that the, uh, the, the, the prison board had remained. So Oberoi had no choice but to pursue further litigation. And in that further litigation, that legal team came up against Kamala Harris, who then was the then attorney general representing the CDCR. And Kamala Harris very vociferously demanded and argued that he should have to shave his beard. Now, civil rights groups at the time heavily criticized Kamala Harris for her stance on this, noting that the military, the military accommodated beards and that medical exemptions existed. I do know this because even in the UK, there are many serving Sikhs in the British Army. And as a British soldier, you are required to train with a respirator. It's part of nuclear, biological, chemical warfare training, NBC training. You are required to train with, with a respirator. And of course, we have many Sikhs in the British Army who have served with distinction. So the precedent is universal. So, um, yeah. As the, uh, as the story went on, the Sikh coalition commented, we adamantly disagree with the maximalist position that Kamala Harris and the CDCR argued. We find it reflective of the systemic nature of workplace discrimination that too often affects Sikhs even today. And uh, it turns out at that point, the Oberoi was offered uh, essentially a bribe. He was offered a payoff, a compensation, and offered another managerial position, which he actually took at the time. Clearly, he needed to make a living. But uh, the fallout of this case it still runs on today. Um, even despite the fact that the state settled, essentially it was a way of avoiding the whole issue on behalf of the state. Um, the, the Sikh coalition can you continue to state that it would ensure that Sikh civil rights are protected if this case was cleared, regardless of who is in the White House. We hope that Harris will champion civil rights for all, including Sikhs, whether she remains in the Senate or becomes a part of the next administration. Basically, the Sikh coalition are now worried that if should Kamala Harris end up in the White House, will she ensure Sikh civil rights are protected? So far, not so good. Harmeet Dillon herself, she was pretty robust in her comments. She remained very critical of Harris's role in the matter. She stated that Harris didn't, in the case, did not have to push back the way she did. Clearly, she was driven. There was some discrimination even on Harris's part, that she fought this case way beyond the requirements of her job role, that she clearly pushed this case way beyond yeah. that. Uh, and Harmeet Dillon said, we had hopes that because of her Indian heritage, she might be more sensitive to the religious discrimination faced by Sikhs. Instead, far from it, she was uncaring, dragged out the case as far as she could, filing every motion and making every argument, even frivolous ones. More galling, the prison department allowed African-American men to have beards if they had a medical condition, but she refused the same accommodation to Sikhs with a, with a religious requirement. And again, she said, the Attorney General, Kamala Harris, 
doesn't get to say she was just doing a job. She says the policy. She had the choice early on to do the right thing in this case, and she didn't. And uh, she then said it, it took a monumental effort on her part, requiring the time and resources of many others to secure Oberoi's victory, which she did in the end. Only after I assembled a national broad coalition of civil rights groups to put pressure on Harris, only after the US Department of Justice, the Civil Rights Division, opened an investigation into the state for its misconduct, that's Kamala Harris's misconduct, did her office relent and settle the case that never should have been filed at all. So uh, very clearly, um, there is concern about Kamala Harris. Um, Dylan herself again said, Kamala Harris has never shown any interest in the rights or needs of the Sikh community. And I certainly wouldn't expect her to start now, having gotten so far in her career with her numerous abuses of civil rights of multiple opposing parties for decades. So, James, it's uh, concerning for the Sikh community. Um, we, I think we try to keep an open mind, but very clearly her track record um, implies something different. She does have Indian heritage, but that clearly doesn't extend to protecting the rights of Sikhs. So I think we're going to have to watch this one very carefully, aren't we, James? Absolutely. And I understand the uh, principles behind the argument for uh, your standard uh, respiratory gear needing that seal. But religious and uh, personal beliefs have to supersede and always have. I mean, you know, with you have a freedom of religion and there are accommodations made, whether it's in the U.S., whether it's in Canada, the U.K., there are accommodations made for the respect of religious beliefs. And this is one case where they decided to take on this fight that absolutely had no basis, not only in the policy that they could have easily changed, but also in the precedents that have already been set, not only in policy and legislation, but also within the legal realm and the, uh, in the legal world. The precedents have been set over and over again. So this here was just a very disrespectful, in my opinion, a very disrespectful and discriminatory policy that they refused to change and just really dragged it out much, much longer and uh, much harsher than it needed to be. And again, those sort of public uh, incidents where it is going through courts and battles, uh, it just gives a really negative light to everybody involved. Not, you know, not just Sikhs, but also others who, who look for religious accommodation that they are entitled to. Yeah, I, I mean, even just, I have to say, from a purely, uh, purely curious perspective, of course, um, the, the members of the Sikh community um, who obviously have the beards, from a practical basis, I am curious how, uh, how they do get around this issue because, of course, the fire service, the army, the police service um, are required to wear respirators in, in many cases. So, uh, but, uh, but we do see Sikhs in all the services. And uh, maybe uh, those in our audience who might actually be working for the emergency services, the police forces, even the military. Um, I am fascinated to know what uh, what is the workaround here, because clearly there are practical issues, but clearly there are workarounds which have proved successful. So, yeah, I think just purely from a from a, from a genuine curiosity perspective, I am fascinated to know what the what the workaround is, because clearly um, there is a there is a religious discrimination case here, which has been legally cleared, which is great. And I'm now fascinated to know what the how, what the practical uh, the practical uh, <laughs> answers are. But anyway, leave that up to our audience. So, yeah, okay, something, let's, something we'll have to research and find out. Indeed. But hopefully somebody in our audience can perhaps enlighten us what the workarounds are there. I am genuinely curious to know what that is. So, OK, let's uh, let's take 10 steps back and take a look at the big picture now. Let's go back to geopolitics, good old geopolitics. And of course, how India is sitting once again in the global scheme of things. So the Quad group of countries uh, is a strange collection of, uh, of nations. They make strange bedfellows or curious bedfellows being of such diverse geographical and indeed cultural uh, Resources. They are very different countries, the United States, Japan, Australia, and of course, India. But they met uh, just the other day and they met to discuss primarily China and the, the threat of China. And uh, the meeting referenced a series of recent confrontations between uh, the Chinese and Philippine vessels in the disputed South China Sea. Now, why is this relevant? Um, that specific part of the discussion isn't directly relevant, uh, but it is to India. 
um, to some degree because, of course, we've reported many, on many occasions how India is slowly but surely being encircled by China in the guise of civilian and commercial interests. But, of course, behind that is the, the military ambitions and, and the military aspirations and naval aspirations of China. Uh, and we do know that China is now encroaching uh, upon India. They are cementing relations in Sri Lanka. Of course, they've got control of one of the key uh, naval bases, or certainly the, I would say, the civilian uh, civilian freight ports in Sri Lanka. Uh, but of course, it's very it's a very quick switch from civilian to to navy. But in this uh, the Quad meeting, uh, the U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken. He is currently on a tour of, of Asia-Pacific countries aimed at reinforcing regional cooperation in the face of Beijing's growing assertiveness. But it's, of course, it's deepening ties with Russia. And this is where it starts getting interesting for India. Now, the Quad Talks, which are currently being held in Tokyo, and these are the first in, uh, in about 10 months. They included uh, the Japanese Foreign Minister Yoko Kamakawa, India's S. Jai Shankar, and Australia's top diplomat Penny Wong. Now, the statement was uh, they released two statements here. Uh, their first statement was as a quad, uh, basically signed by all four countries, which included India. But another statement was then released uh, that only was signed by the US and Japan. And the sta this statement was noticeably more muted than a communique issued after talks on Sunday between Blinken uh, and their Japanese counterparts, without India and Australia present. The two countries issued scathing verbal attacks that, unlike the Quad statement, named and criticised not only China, but also Russia. And that's the key point here, is that this Quad, is, as I said at the, in the opening remarks, is a strange collection of countries. Why is India part of this Quad with the US? And the uh, output from this quad statement was this anti-China thing. Now, India, of course, is aligned with that. India feels very threatened by China. But of course, they needed to talk about the threat of Russia. There's the Ukraine war going on, which the US is, is uh, on the face of it doing its hardest to stop. They have made Russia out to be this huge bogeyman. Russia is evil. Russia is the great enemy, um, as it certainly uh, it seems to be uh, bringing back the uh, reminiscences of the Cold War. But we do know that India is very, very close to Russia. And clearly, India refused to be part of this statement that criticised Russia. And that in itself is significant because the US is trying so hard to bring India on side, to break these bonds that India has with Russia, to say, look, India, you call yourself a democracy, then you need to align with the Western democ democratic nations. Instead, we see that India is still in bed with Russia. India is still buying oil from Russia to feed the, the war machine against Ukraine. India still maintains these deep ties, as, as of course we reported a few weeks ago when Modi visited Vladimir Putin and shook hands, and in fact, embraced Mr. Putin. So again, it's very clear these ties with Russia and India are still as strong that the US are just struggling to break these bonds, even to the extent where this quorum, this quad uh, group of countries, even they could you not unite to make a joint statement against Russia. Instead, India had to drop out. So um, this, uh, this, <laughs> this makes a very, a very interesting comment at the, at the very end of, of an article I read about this. Uh, the professor of international relations at La Trobe University warned that, uh, that the Quad's varied agendas meant their message did not always ring clear. On the one hand, the idea that the four countries are willing to work together on defence and foreign policy issues presents them as a partner of choice in the region compared with China. But global issues such as the war in Ukraine have demonstrated that the Quad countries are not necessarily as like-minded as the rhetoric suggests. So James, very clear on the one hand, Great uh, rhetoric being issued by the countries saying we are aligned, we are a quorum, we are a, a group, all aligned. In reality, no, they're not. India is still in bed with Russia. It's very clear. Yeah. Yeah, and we've seen that time and time again, whether it is uh, the current uh, financial, economic and social issue structures that are being supported and uh, enhanced, we could say, by by India and Russia being in bed together, 
and take that a step further when it comes to the increased uh, projections and goals of trade between the two nations. They want to take up over 50% increase of their mutual trade back and forth, which, you know, they've got very differing uh, goals, but at the same time, many areas they align in their goals. So it's very interesting to see that, uh, to see that synergy between the two. But it also, of course, raises the concern of other nations, such as Canada, such as Australia, such as the U.S., the U.K., and so forth, uh, of that connection and that relationship, because, of course, there is the trade of weapons, there's the trade of energy, and so forth. So it just allows Russia to continue bullying their way and, uh, you know, the illegal war in Ukraine, whether or not we're going to see this also trickle down with uh, China going into Taiwan. And of course, we already know very clearly about the human rights abuses going on in India. And again, this only allows them to continue because that's less pressure on them from foreign governments and using trade as a, a negotiating tool or token to move forward and demand increases in human rights uh, protections for people in India. So it's very mm. interesting, Angus. Yeah, I mean, one has to ask, why is India wanting to still align with Russia? Because very clearly, Russia has been a totalitarian regime, an undemocratic regime since the year dot. But why would India want to pursue that alignment? Now, there are commercial benefits there, sure. But ultimately, India has high ambitions. It's got big aspirations to become a future superpower. Why wouldn't it want to align with democratic nations? And one has to then really dig down into the, the, the thought processes of those who are running India. Clearly, they are the RSS at the moment. They are this, this Hindutva nationalist extremist. And I, I guess just philosophically, they align with a more totalitarian way of doing things. They fear democracy. Um, as we've discussed on many occasions, the, the, the simple caste system. There, are, there is this huge uh, portion of population in India who could very easily overthrow their ruling class, but they are all controlled within this system, this very tightly controlled system that keeps the lid on any trouble. And it's the, the upper caste that are controlling it. They do not want to relinquish this control. So and I think this, this really filters down to the philosophy of what drives India. It is driven by control. It needs, the upper caste needs to retain control. And therefore, philosophically, I think it is more aligned to totalitarian regimes. And I suspect, James, that's my interpretation of why India fears democracy, why it will not let go of its friends like Russia. Absolutely. And something that you touched on is the uh, ambitions and the potential for India to become a superpower. And I think that if they were to re- uh, visit their principles, their ethics, and their democracy, their constitution, and really refocus and look after their people. And uh, I think they definitely could be not just a superpower, but an amazing leader in the world uh, to lead the way in many areas if they decide to make those changes. But again, we don't see that happening under the Modi government. We don't see it happening right now. Uh, but we don't know what the future holds. So let's hope that they, uh, you know, start to renegotiate because once you start to spread yourself to meet the demands and the changing, uh, the changing winds of each nation that they're trying to work with on all sides, they're going to uh, water down and lose their own national identity as Indians and uh, as a strong nation. So they're going to lose their identity if they're not careful as well. Yeah. It's going to be an interesting, uh, interesting next few decades for for India, uh, but we'll see. Absolutely. We'll see. Okay, let's let's move on to a quick update on, on Amrit Pal Singh's situation. Uh, just a little bit of news filtering out again from the Punjab, and uh, Chief Minister Bhagwant Man, who's uh, faced all sorts of criticisms from the uh, the Sikh community. He has refused to again revoke the National Security Act, the NSA ruling against uh, Amrit Pal Singh. 
And this, of course, has uh, evoked huge anger locally within the Punjab, and particularly in his his constituency, the Kadur Saib constituency, where he was recently elected as their member for the Lok Sabha. Now, uh, responding to a media question at Jalandhar during a press conference just a few days ago, uh, Congress MP and former Chief Minister Charanjit Singh Chani made a speech um, in which he favoured the release of Amrit Pal Singh. But uh, in response to that speech, uh, Mann, the Bhagwat Man, the current Chief Minister, said, it is their own stand. As per our stand, we are making efforts to maintain law and order in the Punjab. I'm not a custodian of an MP, but of 3.5 crore people. So Bhagwant Man very clearly, as Chief Minister, washing his hands of the whole affair, saying, I've got to take care of law and order in the Punjab. I don't care about Amrit Pal Singh. Well, very, uh, very democratic of you, Mr. Mr. Man, despite the fact that, uh, that uh, Amrit Pal Singh has been duly elected a member of parliament for part of the Punjab. But let's brush that under the carpet. Now, a day before the recently held parliamentary elections, uh, Bhagwant Man led the AAP government uh, to extend his and his nine A's detention under the NSA by at least three months and potentially up to another full year. While doing so, the Man government didn't bother the growing resentment or didn't bother about the growing resentment among the people of Punjab against it. And uh, as it states in this article, once again, the chief minister showed ruthlessness against the Sikhs as per human rights bodies. Absolutely. Human rights bodies around the world have been calling this out as, as, as an outrage against the rule of law. And uh, but on the other hand, rising above the party stand, Chani registered a protest against Amrit Pal Singh's confinement under the NSA in his daring speech. So you have to say full marks to Charanjit Singh Chani. Um, who uh, represents the Congress party, he actually stood up and recognised how against the normal rule of law Amrit Pal Singh's detention, and of course his, his colleagues' detention, are. This, this whole detention under the NSA just flies in the face of any normal legal protocol. It's, uh, as we've said on many occasions, it is a legal <coughs> outrage. And actually, his argument, uh, Chani argued that uh, it exposed an emergency-like situation in India. Uh, and uh, Chani was listing the various instances that reflect the emergency, including atrocities against minorities and unprivileged sections of society. And he said, there is another emergency. 20 lakh people of Punjab elected a youth as their member of parliament. However, this member of parliament is being kept behind bars under the NSA. His freedom of speech is being suppressed. He is not able to raise the voice of his constituency in Parliament. This is an emergency. So, yeah, you've got to respect uh, Mr. Chani uh, and his courage to stand up and call this out because not many people are in India. And those that do are really sticking their heads above the parapet. It takes courage to stand up to the Modi regime and call it out for what it is, uh, fighting against the rule of law. This whole... Um, this whole array of legal instruments that they have created, the NSA, the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, form part of many parts of the overall legislative array that is designed to quell dissent. It is designed to oppress people who politically disagree with the regime of India. It's a very dangerous situation and it takes yeah. courage for people like Chani to stand up and call it out. So well done, Mr. Chani. Unfortunately, he is up against this brick wall of, uh, of the, the Indian government who are clearly refusing to budge on this. And as I've said on many occasions, James, it's going to take a lot of people power to change things. And something that we've spoken about time and time again is the uh, breach of human rights and the, uh, you know, and the freedoms of the citizens of India. So this, again, is just another shining example of those uh, human rights abuses. But let's uh, hope that the pressure continues to build to get him out of that jail cell and back into the office that he was elected to fill that seat and to represent his constituents. So let's keep the pressure up. I think what is significant here is that clearly this message is moving up the political chain. It's not just the people on the ground yes. at grassroots levels who are demanding his release and saying what an outrage it is legally. It's not just his legal team saying this. Now we've got a former chief minister actually standing up 
of another political party standing up and saying, hang on, this is not right. We cannot do this in a so-called democratic yeah. India. So, yeah, it's uh, clearly momentum is gathering. Now that uh, Amrit Pal Singh is an elected member of the Lok Sabha, clearly he's swaying a lot more weight now. He's swinging weight and more and more people are now taking up his cause. And it is, again, clear, clearly going up the political ladder. And it only takes a few more political heavyweights to join in this chorus. And Mr Modi is going to find himself in a bit of a corner trying to defend his, his position on this. And I can foresee in the foreseeable future that I think Amrit Pal Singh may have to be released for Mr Modi's popularity's sake. I think um, it only takes a few more political yeah. heavyweights to join in the chorus. I think Modi will find himself in a situation where he will have no choice to, but to save face and release Amrit Pal Singh under whatever conditions he may, he may have to do so. So, yeah, we'll keep you posted on progress on uh, Amrit Pal Singh's situation. And uh, our thoughts, of course, go to his family who are fighting so hard uh, for his freedom. Now, let us move on to the yeah, comments the section. And the incredible strength and courage of his family is just amazing. Indeed, indeed. And our, uh, as I say, our thoughts are, are with them and our support continues. So our comments. Uh, let's start off with uh, one of our earlier shows, India Has You Covered. And we received a, uh, an interesting comment from Manjit Singh. Sikhs are being fooled by everyone. One day this channel talks about pro Khalistan issues. Next day it's all about the Indian budget. Now, I wanted to raise this comment because I'm actually quite curious about it. So I think the implication here is one minute we're talking about pro khalistan issues and then suddenly we're, we're talking about much bigger issues that affect the whole of India. I think if that is uh, the correct interpretation of your comment, I would only defend it by saying we are actually our channel covers many uh, many topics and many areas. We have to, um, because we want to, uh, we want to portray any uh, relevant stories to the Punjab, to the Sikh community, the Sikh diaspora. It's a huge area. And of course, even the Indian budget does affect, of course, it affects the Punjab. It affects the Sikh community in the Punjab. It affects many things. And also the implications, which I think we touched on, was that uh, the, the regions around India are heavily affected, of course, by the budget. Many regions are very unhappy by what happened in the budget because they feel that they are contributing more to central government, to the, the cow belt, should we call it, than they are receiving in return. And of course, I think it was even Tamil Nadu at one stage recently said, well, we'll break away if we're not if we're not getting enough, if we're not getting value for money from Delhi, then we will break away from India. And that's the key here. This is why things like this are relevant to, for example, the whole Khalistan issue. Um, so, yeah, James, I think uh, we, we deliberately choose stories that are very varied because there's only so much we can talk about Khalistan. But of course, we do like to cover other things that we think are indirectly uh, relevant to the whole issue. Absolutely. And of course, we always take suggestions uh, for stories from the viewers. We want you to be a part of the show and we appreciate you bringing this uh, up and allowing us to explain it as Angus just did. But again, we are always open to story ideas uh, because again, we want to have stories that appeal to our viewers and you are the viewer. So by all means, share your story ideas with us. Indeed. And uh, yeah, Manjit, I think I think the answer to your comments is, uh, well, you tell us what would you what would you like us to talk about? Leave a comment uh, after today's show. Tell us what you would be interested in hearing about. We'll be delighted to uh, to cover the sorts of things that you'd like to hear about. So let us know. Do let us know. OK, and uh, the podcast with Colonel Singh, where we talked about um, Mahatma Gandhi and, of course, the, uh, the caste hierarchy and the caste system. An awful lot of comments after this story. Amrik Singh said, Sikhi and Khalistan will sort all this nonsense caste system. Indeed. And uh, as I think as, uh, as we've mentioned on many occasions, clearly uh, the whole concept of Khalistan and the whole philosophy of, of Sikhi uh, just has no patience and no, no place for any sort of societal hierarchy like the caste system and nothing as extreme as this. And I think you're absolutely right. I think, James, you'd agree there. Khalistan, if it should, as and when it comes about, I think there will be no place in Khalistan for a caste system. Absolutely. 
Right, Maz87 made a couple of comments. Bro, Gandhi was racist. He was indeed very racist, as uh, we reported in one of our earlier interviews uh, talking about Mahatma Gandhi. And he was a Hindu supremacist. He absolutely was. He was from the upper caste. He fooled Hindus, Muslim clergy, and also English pagans. He certainly did. The Muslim clergy still call him Mahatma Gandhi. Yeah, as do the British. We, uh, we revere him. We hold him up as some champion of human rights. In fact, the reality is a very different story, as, uh, as, we, uh, as we discussed in that podcast. If you don't believe me, watch that podcast. The disgusting thing about this caste system is that those who are on the receiving end have accepted it and aren't resisting it. Yeah, absolutely, James. We talked about this, I think, on yesterday's show to uh, a, a large extent. Uh, the, car the, the clever thing about the caste system, as we mentioned, is that those, uh, most of the people in that pyramid have a stake in the system. They benefit from that system, even though the majority, the vast majority of people in that pyramid are themselves slaves. They benefit from the system because they in turn have their own slaves. Of course, those at the very bottom, the untouchables, the Dalits, um, who are the greatest losers of this evil system. Thank you for that comment. Now, 5AB84 said, Modi said Indian people must be atam nirbar, meaning uh, they shouldn't depend on the government. So why do we need them? Why do we need the government? Good point. Now, I actually uh, I had to look at what atam nirbar means. And I think Narendra Modi is a great champion of this uh, this concept. And as I understand it, the whole concept basically means India um, should be self-sufficient. India is for, for India. It should be run by Indians. It doesn't need uh, foreigners. It doesn't need outsiders to make India a success. So I think this, uh, I think your comment is a slight twisting of, 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 uh, of my understanding of what uh, Atam Nibar means. But I think you're absolutely right. If Modi says that they should, India should be self-sufficient, you could turn this back towards Khalistan. If the Punjab is self-sufficient, why does the Punjab need the rest of India? Absolutely. I think, James, I think it's all about uh, not just uh, self-determination. It's all about autonomy. If the Punjab can show it can run itself, why shouldn't it run itself? Yeah, absolutely. And of course, there is outside influence when it comes to, you know, human rights or trade when it comes to, uh, you know, aid and, uh, you know, foreign assistance. So there's so many things that the India government relies on other governments, just as much as Canada relies on India and other governments as well, when it comes to the international things. And of course, we have to be diplomatic in how we how we deal with each other. So but for the most part, yeah, I think that, uh, yeah, it's a very interesting comment and we appreciate that. Yeah. And I think as, as per the earlier comment from Manjit about uh, when we talked about the, um, the budget, uh, it's very, again, very relevant because the budget itself, uh, as we reported, um, Modi has had no choice but to open India up to foreign direct investment. He's now incentivizing outside nations to invest in India because he's realized Actually, India does need foreign investment if it is to grow at the rate it needs to grow to fulfill right. its ambitions. So, SB6559, uh, thank you for this link. This link, uh, for those who are wondering what it is, this is a link to Dr. Ambedkar's interview, a fascinating interview in 1955 with the BBC. It relates very heavily to the subject of this podcast. I won't talk about it in detail now um, because we're up against the clock, but I would, uh, I would urge people to watch this interview. Very, very interesting, very revealing interview with Dr. Ambetka, one of the key stakeholders, the key people involved um, in the time of Mahatma Gandhi, uh, in the time of um, when, when uh, the Dalits were essentially brought into the Hindu religion as essentially as slaves under the system. Uh, there was talk about them becoming Sikhs and there was talk about Dr. Ambedkar himself becoming a Sikh. But the upper caste made sure that he and therefore the Dalits did not become Sikhs because they clearly were terrified of suddenly, I think at the time, I forget the numbers, it was something like 50 million um, Indians suddenly becoming Sikhs. Essentially, that meant that there were 50 million uh, potential uh, opponents of the caste system, uh, potential 50 million soldiers fighting for the Punjab, fighting for Khalistan. That was their, their fear. So, but yeah, thank you for that link. Uh, very, uh, very helpful link. 
Right, the great betrayal again. Here we go. The Labour government. Oh, James, British politics. Betrayal. This awful word once again that just crops up time and time again for the Sikh community. It's appalling. Jaspal Chatterful says, Labour government already paddled back. Shame, shame, shame. Indeed. Hope these 12 Sikh, uh, Sikh Labour MPs raise their disappointment in the Foreign Secretary. Remind the Prime Minister of his own comments about his comments. Absolutely. Oh, it's betrayal. I mean, we reported in yesterday's sto uh, story about how uh, the British Foreign Secretary, David Lammy, is refusing to say the simple words that Jagtar Singh Johal is arbitrarily detained. A very key phrase, which basically means that, uh, that he agrees, as does the British Prime Minister, as they agreed earlier, they said that Jagtar Singh Johal is unlawfully detained by that phrase. But now he's refusing to say that. He's backtracked. Oh dear, James. So I just, yeah. I shake my head in uh, unsurprise and despair. <laughs> Pol politicians around the world, shocking, all, I know. All, <laughs> all I would say is, are you surprised? Is anybody surprised? I think we could have predicted this, as we keep saying. And uh, Tajinder Singh, so. yeah, Tajinder Singh follows up uh, same thing. Thank you, Angus and James, for brilliant reporting. Well, thank you for your brilliant comments. I'm especially disheartened at the UK Labour Party's backtracking in the case of Jaggi Jayal. As are we all, and we will keep pursuing this. We will keep reporting every time the Labour government betrays its promises as they are coming thick and fast now, we will keep reporting on it from our own small voice out there on the internet and on, on the TV channels. We will keep reporting it. We will keep highlighting it. We will keep campaigning on behalf of the community. And uh, we will keep pressuring uh, our own MPs here in the UK. Now, Janagra 9781 said, a great show of strength and solidarity by Sikhs. The majority of Sikhs want to get out of India and end slavery. Yeah, again, uh, referring to the caste system and, of course, the general slavery, the DNA. I think there was a comment yesterday about how slavery is embedded into the DNA of most Indians because they've lived in this cultural straitjacket of the caste system all their lives. And, of course, it goes back two or 3,000 years. And of course, the majority of the Sikhs, as has been demonstrated for decades, if not more than decades, centuries even, they want to get out of this slavery. They, the, the Sikhs can see it for what it is. For some reason, the rest of India can't, but those, the Sikhs in the Punjab and the Sikhs in the diaspora could see it. That's why so many left the Punjab, not just for economic reasons, but they could see what was happening in India. So, uh, yeah, great comment, great comment. And yeah. then uh, finally on this page, Cal Stan Jatt, one of our regular commenters. Ah, th yeah, this is an interesting one, James. Please also try to take some phone calls on the show. Now, uh, yeah, very good comment, this. And um, I would say uh, in our technical roadmap, sometime in the future, this is not impossible. <laughs> At the moment, uh, we are too small a channel and at the moment it is not practically possible. There are, there are certain practical problems that we have, not least the, the, uh, the time zones involved. Of course, James is in Vancouver, I'm in London, there is an eight hour difference. So the question is when, it would, it, uh, to have phone calls, it would imply it is a live show. Now, great to do a live show, but then what time zone do we do the live show? It probably implies that uh, it has to be either like four o'clock in the morning for one of us or the other. Um, it just practically, it, it presents all sorts of problems because of course, what time zone would it have to be for our audience? Now, the big question here is where is our audience? And that's actually a good question. I'd be interested if our audience, let us know in the comments, where are you watching us from? We do know there is a large amount of people from the US. And of course, Canada, there is a, a certain number from the UK. Um, we have a very small number from the Punjab itself and India. We know we are blocked in India. So, of course, our audience is very limited in India. But, uh, yeah, you look at those time zones and there is a huge uh, variety of time zones. So what time would the show have to go live 
to mean that uh, those who want to call in are awake. And not just awake, they're not at work. They're at home, they're available to make phone calls. So um, yeah, absolutely, it, it is in our roadmap. It does imply that we need a much bigger team because of course, if we go live, we then need a lot of people behind the camera, behind the scenes, controlling everything. We need somebody to, to uh, look after the switchboard. We need to look after somebody to look after all the camera equipment and the streaming, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it does bring with it um, a whole host of technical issues, a whole host of uh, personnel issues. Um, but as I said, we would like to do this, but we can only do this if this channel grows. At the moment, we have over 14,000 subscribers. Thank you very much to each and every one of you individual people who have subscribed to, to, to the channel. Thank you for that. Um, it is very much appreciated. And of course, technical issues have now hit us because my light has gone out. <laughs> this is the problem with not having a huge team behind the scenes who can, I, I can't send a runner out to suddenly get my light on. So you just have to see me over here in the darkness. But uh, anyway, yeah, so back to the point. Um, yes, uh, we need the channel to grow much larger uh, before we can do things like that. So please spread the word. We need to get the word out that we exist. We are being shadow banned, we do know that. So we need you, our, our wonderful audience, to spread the word. Get, uh, get more and more people to subscribe to the channel. The more subscribers we have, the more resources we can then throw into this and we can grow the team and we can go live. We would love to do this, actually. We would very much love to do it. But uh, yeah, James, any thoughts on that one? Uh, just one alternative for people who are interested in having their physical voice heard uh, is that you can always send us audio recordings or video recordings via our email or send us a link in the comments section to your comments. So if you wanna have your, your actual voice on the show or your, or your face, by all means, share videos and audio clips with us and we'd be happy to uh, go through those as well. It may not be real time and we can't actually have a conversation in that real space, but it's another alternative in the meantime until we get to that point. So just wanted to you know, bring that Excellent up as well. Excellent idea. Yeah, great idea, James. So if uh, in, in, instead of a phone call that we can't do at the moment, if you want to make a voice recording into your phone or whatever, email us uh, to our, our, our message at satellitetv.com email address. Email us a voice note, uh, a voice recording of your question or your comment. And yeah, we'll talk about it in the comment section. We will bring it up. That's a great idea, James. So uh, those of you who do want to do that, send it in. Yeah, um, we, don't we will, be shy. Uh, Use the video as well. We will essentially, uh, yeah, treat it as a phone call or even a video call. So great call, James. And uh, to wrap up the show today, our final comment. I love this comment from, again, one of our regulars, Jasleen JJJS, who made the following comment. Great presentation, Angus and James. Thank you for your comments. Um, eventually, the UK will toe the line that the USA will draw. Absolutely. We said this and we know this. The, the, the UK tends to follow what the, the, the US demands. But in the meantime, dollar weighs more than human rights, doesn't it just? Also, Labour or Conservative, it's all the same. As party is just the front, but the real power lies elsewhere. Some call it the deep state. Yeah, absolutely spot on. Uh, I don't know about you, James, in Canada, but certainly in the UK, we our two main opposition parties opposing each other are actually um, basically one and the same. There, there is almost no difference in their policies. They... Uh, they essentially represent the same sorts of ideas, same sorts of concepts. But in reality, we, we, it's become popular opinion that there is a deep state, that actually there are those behind the scenes who are controlling the levers of power. I guess it's the same in, in, in Canada, James. Absolutely, it is, Angus, yes, uh, for the most part. And we do have more than the two main parties. We have three, essentially, and then we have some other smaller parties. But again throw them all into a pot together and you pretty much get the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Politicians again. And uh, you continue. It'll be interesting to see what happens after November 2024. Indeed, it will. Uh, but Sikhs are resilient in the face of betrayals. They certainly are, as they've seen it happening too many times. It is sad, yet it's also the source of our determination to never give up. We only seek our Guru's blessings on our side. And I love this quote. Try us, world. Try us. We know how to inhale the storm. Khalistan Zindabad G. Beautiful uh, motto. I love that, James. I love it as well. Yeah, it's, it's so true, though, isn't it? 
It is, and, and I'm very curious actually, is this, are these the words of the guru? I don't know, please let me know, because I did Google it, because I thought, I assumed they are the words of the guru, and I Googled it, it didn't come up with anything, so let me know, I'm very, I'm very interested to know where that came from. I think it's a, it's a beautiful motto, and a, a great motto to finish the show on, and I'll repeat it once again, try us world, try us, we know how to inhale the storm. Fabulous, fabulous. But there you have it, and we must wrap things up there. And of course, you have been watching Perspectives. Don't forget to keep those comments coming in. We do love reading them out. We do love talking about them, as you know. So do keep them coming in. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, you can message us directly at message at satledgetv.com. Send us voice notes, send us videos, whatever it is. Let us know what your thoughts and comments are. But in the meantime, thank you so much for watching Perspectives. It is goodbye from me, and it's goodbye from James. Thanks everyone for watching and uh, sharing with everyone else and stay safe out there. You have of course been watching Perspectives. We will see you next time.